I always like to start off when I talk about the issues of marine litter, start off with this particular slide. This was taken in 1955, Life magazine, and it had a celeb celebratory title saying, Throw Away Living. So what, when, you, when you read the article, it went on to dis, uh, describe that basically all the items falling from the sky would take a housewife up to 40 hours to actually clean them. But they were saying that with this new throw away living, that this would, uh, would these lo longer activities would no longer be required. And I think it's always good to kind of start of where this actual change of this kind of single use kind of lifestyle actually begun. And its roots are as far back as 1955. So some of the other uh, speakers spoke about the whole issues of kind of uh, in relation to plastics. It was like 6.3 billion tonnes produced since 1950, 9% has been recycled, 12% has been incinerated and up to 79% has been dumped, has been put into landfill or entered into the marine environment. So when we look at, when it comes to actually marine litter, 80% of it actually comes from land-based activities. And then within this, 70% of actually litter is uh, made of plastic. But when you look at it, 50% of this particular actual plastics are single use. So we use them for five minutes, uh, to take five minutes to create, and to take up to 500 years to break down. So when we look at marine litter, it comes from a numerous different sources. So it's everything from recreational use, use in our beaches and in our parks, but also uh, sewage related litter, so I'll talk about that later, that's everything from in, in, our, in our kind of sinks and our, in our toilets, but we often see things like uh, in the transport industry, that, that, that's the source of litter as well, and obviously the fishing industry, and then in industry as well in our, in our streets. So it comes, there's no kind of one source for marine litter unfortunately. So the impacts, so the UN estimates by 2050 that 99% of all seabirds will have ingested uh, uh, some sort of uh, forms of plastic and currently it, uh, it impacts 600 different types of marine species and of them 15% of them are actually endangered species. So as I was saying it, it's we've all seen the imagery from uh, of online with everything from like uh, from turtles kind of uh, ingesting plastic bags to abandoned ghost netting, which is at a, having a big impact with seals and dolphins and stuff like that. But also we, we're now seeing is the impact of uh, microbeads and plastics and microplastics that are entering and actually the food chain and that. So when you look at it at a global uh, impact, they estimated that up to a, a million seabirds are currently uh, dying from the impact of marine plastics but also an up to 100,000 marine animals. But it's interesting because the different species are affected differently. So you look at things like the, the full mirror bird, which is a surface area feeder, that is, uh, that is having a massive impact in relation to uh, the impact of uh, marine plastics. Some of the research, there's been a number of different studies and the, uh, up to 90% of specimens have uh, ingested uh, marine plastics and that. So unfortunately it affects different species differently as well. And the one thing uh, what really kind of brings up, uh, brings it back is this, you know the when Carl Sagman talked about the pale blue dot, like when you look at our planet it is 70% plus is covered in water and everything with the oceanic currents it's also inter interconnected. It's the same with like air pollution, same with marine pollution, everything is very much interconnected. And this particular story is quite interesting. Back in 1992, 22,000 ducks fell off a, uh, a ship out in China. And is it, these particular ducks have made their way all across our oceans into different uh, ocean currents. And like 15 years later, 70,000 miles away, they've been uh, showing up in bitter, uh, British beaches. And that kind of shows you how this kind of is such an, a global issue. And we see it the whole time when we do our undertake our beach cleans with community groups, you would get loads of kind of uh, material coming from Asia, coming from Africa and stuff like that. So it's like, it's very much a global issue. This particular, it's a very famous image. It's from uh, Midway in Ana uh, Anatol. And that's it, it's from a nature reserve. So this is a very, limited populated area and it kind of just shows you the impact it's having this is like in the middle of the pacific 
where it's far from uh, inhabited areas. And yeah, this particular picture, I got this, this was taken last, uh, sorry, last month. Uh, Victor Visco, I'm not pronouncing his name, but basically he went down 11 kilometers in the Marianne Trench, so it's the deepest part of the, uh, the Pacific, deepest person that uh, furthest ever down. And one of the first things he came across was a plastic bag. So unfortunately, uh, this particular issue is having a massive, massive impact. Okay. I hope I didn't depress you so far. Okay, so this brings it into what, what we do in relation to this particular issue. So the Clean Coast program, it was first established in 2004, right? And what we do is we do a number of different initiatives and campaigns. And it's across, the, and it's everything, what we're trying to do is make a positive impact on the ground. And it's about like celebrating our coast, as well as looking after it. Uh, what, the way it works is we have 12 different staff located in seven different locations around the coastline and we have over 800 clean coast groups. So it, last year we estimated around 22,000 people engaged, 22,000 volunteers engaged with the programme and we estimated that we removed about 286 tonnes of litter from our beaches. So uh, the kind of like the main work is with it is with the actual clean coast groups. So they're everything from there everything from community groups to families to scouts to GAA clubs they're very they come from all cross sector and it's all about getting people to adopt the area it's like the like the things like with environmental issues it's like the tragedy of the commons and it's trying to get people to kind of gain, uh, kind of give ownership of these particular areas and look after them so some of the groups might go out like uh, two or three times a year and some of the groups might go out weekly or daily so it, it very much whatever way they want to engage with the program. Uh, within we have two big calls to actions so in Ireland the baiting season runs from June to uh, September and what we do is we try to get as many groups out as possible so a couple of weeks ago we had clean, uh, clean coast week and we had over 160 cleanups but it's also it's about celebration of the coast so we had a number of different yoga yoga events, you know, marron grass planting, and it's trying to get people to get out there and enjoy the coast because like if you love it, you'll protect it is what we try to uh, get out there. Well, at the end of the bathing season, we have another event called the Big Beach Clean. This is trying to close the bathing season in Ireland. And what we do with this is, again, it's like we had 195 uh, cleanups back in September last year. But we also do data litter surveys. So what we do is we uh, link in with an organisation called Ocean Survey. They're an international organisation. And we do data litter surveys to see what's coming up in our beaches. So question for the audience. Right, this is the international top 10, the usual suspects as there's known. Is there any, there's two particular items that don't show up on the Irish top 10 that shows up in the international top 10. Does anyone want to guess? Exactly. <laughs> so it is the plastic bag. So the plastic bag levy was introduced in 2002 and it's led to a 95 reduction of the amount of plastic bags in the marine environment. And like that's an example of a kind of a top down policy change making an impact on the marine environment. So they, uh, when the international it is always showing up. And it was interesting, I was reading the UN report there last year. Uh, or a couple of months ago, and they actually look at Ireland for that particular policy change as an exemplar model. So we have, uh, we have, uh, we also do corporate volunteering. I think someone spotted someone in the know there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we also do corporate volunteering as well. This is something that's quite popular in the Dublin region because there's uh, it uh, with the amount of kind of uh, tech companies and etc. etc. And last year we had over 1,200 volunteers that engaged uh, with the corporate volunteering and we removed over a tonne. But what we do as well is uh, companies make donations on behalf to the actual Clean Coast program. And what we do with that money is that's, that's actually given back to our community groups as a grant scheme so they can apply for different material for their community groups. And last year we gave out 26,000 in grants to that particular project. So you can see it makes a, it's a given back in that regard. So that these companies are making a double impact. And as well, we also 
groups might start off with beach cleaning, but then they kind of establish and go on to something else. So it's very much about building social capital. It, you know, it's about empowering these groups to kind of move on to uh, the next project. So they might go into engage with the, the local authority about beach management. They might uh, start undertaking kind of conservation projects. So we, in, like, in our work, try to empower these groups as well. So the importance of building social capital, and there's so many spring, uh, spin off from that. But one of the other projects we work on is called the Green Coast Award. And what this particular award, it is, it is for kind of like beaches that don't have the facilities that the blue flags would have, but to have excellent water quality. But what they would have to do is have to have an active community group that are, that are, uh, uh, have adopted the area. So we try to kind of, education is very much a part of our work as well. So we, each year we have like, road shows and we also have the Ocean Heroes Award. What we try to do is basically celebrate our Clean Coast groups because we have some fantastic groups and they just try to award the work they're doing. And as again, it's try we run this photography competition as well called the Love Your Coast Com Competition. It's in our 10th year and it's, it's fantastic. It, it, again, I know I'm reiterating again, but it's all about getting people to appreciate what beautiful coastline we have and it's interesting like I, I'm an awfully man originally so you're wondering what a midlander would have a clue about the coast but once I started working in this particular role like it's I was just blown away by even the, the Dublin coastline like it's and it's it's sometimes it's undiscovered that people don't know actually what's on their doorstep so our campaigns so what we do we have a number of different campaigns with our uh, two minute beach clean think before you flush beat the microbeads and it's very much about behavioural change, trying to kind of like uh, empower people to make positive actions. So the two minute beach clean, it, this is very much about micro, micro volunteerism. So basically get people to make small actions, you know, when they're down the beach, spend two minutes doing cleanups. It's quite a hipster thing to do as well because there's a social media aspect to it. And so we have these things, these two minute beach clean boards uh, around, all around, dotted around Ireland, and you can have litter pickers and uh, bags from that you just undertake a clean up when you're walking along the beach because like generally sometimes people just don't have the time to spend two or three hours on a Saturday and stuff like that and then they can come and go as they please. The Think Before You Flush campaign is in conjunction with Irish Water and this is tried to highlight the whole issues of sewerage related litter so unfortunately people sometimes treat our toilets like their bins but there's uh, that's not uh, unfortunately there's only three things that should go into toilets. Everything else should go into bins. I won't, I won't explain which three are, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you guys. But there's one thing as well, what, what we see on the ground is this big impact that wet wipes are having. Like they're an, an absolute scourge on their, a lot of companies are saying that these particular items are flushable when they're not. They're made from plastic fibers and they're making a massive impact on our marine environment. And unfortunately they're, they're flowing through the wastewater treatment plants. So please, please, please never put them into the toilets. But it's interesting as well, the, what you might have noticed as well, the cotton butt sticks, traditionally cotton butt sticks would have been com come in plastic. They were originally cardboard and then they were plastics and now they've reverted back to cardboard again. And that's an example of a kind of a, a grassroots led campaign, so a bottom up approach. So the kind of message I'm trying to get to here is like there's no silver bullet to allow all these particular issues. It's called like it's there's many approaches to kind of tackle this particular issue. So we, we have a kind of a, a heavy social media presence as well. So we try to kind of highlight particular issues. We like some of our hasht uh, hashtags like hashtag retro rubbish. And it's interesting when you look at the issues or when you look at when you look at the issues of marine plastics and plastics in general, like 15% uh, of the total amount is what we see on our beaches. The other 15% is in the water column, and then the last 70% is actually on the seabed. So anytime there's storm surges, we get a lot, a lot of this historical litter that ends up on our beaches, so we can get to see what the impacts are. Uh, uh, so the, one of the previous speakers was talking about the connection from the environment and mental health, and it is this is what that's one thing we definitely see. Like uh, I'm now an avid sea swimmer myself. 
from uh, this particular role. But what we've done is we try to we try to engage with other avenues. So we engage with the first fortnight festival to have a sea swimming event, and these are kind of like just different ways to kind of engage in this particular issue rather than a, you're bad, you shouldn't do that. So it's just trying to trying to spin it in a more positive way, and also using the arts to highlight this particular issue. Uh, one of our groups collected over 19 sacks uh, of rubbish through the summer season last year and they were based out at the 40 foot. And this has tried to highlight the whole issue of fast fashion, which is also having a big impact now in our, on our marine environment. So this particular art exhibit, we've done it with IADDT and Daenerys Rat Down, and it was a very, very successful, and it was a powerful way of just highlighting what is washing up in our beaches or what is actually being left behind irresponsibly. Okay, so just outside of our work, one or two things I wanted to highlight just quickly. So it's interesting, about two years ago, Blue Planet, Blue Planet came out, and that was a massive awareness raising about the whole issues of marine plastics. There was definitely got a lot more people aware on it. There's last year single use was the was the Collins English Dictionary year of the word, so it shows you like it's a lot more getting in traction. And then you can see other organisations are trying to push uh, plastics to be classified as a hazardous waste. And then obviously with Leslie talking about the zero waste movement and stuff like that. So there's lots of kind of different things that are currently happening globally that are making making kind of big uh, impacts. And when you look at it kind of like in, in Ireland, uh, we have kind of a couple of kind of downstream kind of campaigns like the refill campaign and the conscientious cup. They're trying to highlight the whole issues of single use items. But it's not just, it's interesting, I was talking to some of the people who work with these organizations and it's not just about like, you're only like, it's only a cup and stuff like that. It's just about changing that whole mindset that this throwaway living, this like it's, Everything is so interlinked when it comes to environment. Like uh, the last speaker spoke about, you know, these coffee cups coming 3,000 miles away and stuff like that. Every time you use certain items, there's energy in using that. And unfortunately, the big challenge we're coming up against now is climate change as well. We also, we've a, a lot of kind of grassroots, uh, grassroots campaign around Friends of the Earth has made a big, big impact. And then obviously the EU has bringing up new legislation for 2021 in relation to reducing single-use plastics. In Ireland, the Green Party have implemented, tried to push forward a, a deposit return system which has been quite successful in other countries. So that's it. Um, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank you.